So with that, I would like to turn it over to Peter Annan, who will be our next speaker. Uh, I think those of you that have heard P Peter speak before, you don't need much of an introduction, so I'll try to keep it brief. He's the director of the Mary Griggs Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation at Northland College and the author of the Great Lakes Water Wars, which is a definitive work on the Great Lakes water diversion controversy. Before coming to Northland in 2015, Peter served as a reporter at Newsweek, the associate director of the Institute for Journalism and Natural Resources, and the managing director of the University of Notre Dame's Environmental Change Initiative. He continues to report on the Great Lakes water diversion issue and publish a second edition of the Great Lakes Water Wars in the fall of 2018. The book is for sale out front and at lunchtime, Peter will be out there signing copies of the book for any of you who would like to buy it. One other thing, Peter just had an op-ed piece published in the New York Times, I believe it was on Wednesday, about water and the water problems we are facing and going to face in this country. So Peter, I will turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Well, I like to start my talks for, with a welcome, of course, but also I always do a poll of the audience, a Great Lakes poll. It's a stand-up, sit-down thing. It'll seem a little bit silly at first, but you'll know where I'm headed. And if you can't stand, just raise your hand, but it's fun, more fun if everybody does a stand-up, sit-down thing. So everyone stand who has visited at least one North American Great Lake. <laughs> yeah. Remain standing if you visited two, three, four, and all five. All right, good, we're not done. Stand if you have immersed yourself in at least one North American Great Lake, accidental or intentional, doesn't matter. <clears throat> Immerse yourself in two, three, four, and all five. These are the diehards. Will you join me in recognizing them with a round of applause? Well, it's good to be here again. John and I were talking about, it was probably about 10 years ago that I was here, uh, here last, and uh, it's uh, always exciting to be around such an engaged audience on this amazing ecosystem that we have here in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region. So I'm gonna click through a lot of content pretty quickly, and then we'll get to, uh, get to Q&A here uh, in about a half an hour. So the thesis of my talk today and my book is that the Great Lakes region, the North American continent, and the entire world are all entering a period of increased water tension. Those tensions are primarily driven by water scarcity, and they're going to put increased pressure on water-rich regions of the world, like the North American Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Consequently, there's been a collective agreement among the water intelligentsia in the Great Lakes region that the region needs a modern, binding, world-class water management agreement as we enter this era of increasing global water insecurity, and that is the Great Lakes Compact. And so the Great Lakes Compact just celebrated its 10th anniversary, um, and you know, so we'll be looking today at what lessons have been learned during the last 10 years in the Great Lakes water diversion controversy. But before we do, let's just look at the global water picture, which is grim and predicted to get grimmer. There's a lot of water on the grade school globe, but only 1% of the Earth's surface water is, is accessible, drinkable, fresh water, just 1%. 800 million people around the world lack access to clean drinking water today. Two million, mostly children, around the world die annually from unhealthy water conditions. According to the UN, global water demand is expected to surge by 55% by 2050. And also, according to the UN, two-thirds of the global population, two-thirds of the global population will be water stressed by 2025. 
In my opinion, the most egregious example of water mismanagement on the face of the earth has occurred in the Aral Sea watershed. In Central Asia, you can see it's sandwiched up there between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. In 1960, Aral Sea was the fourth largest inland water body in the world, roughly the size of Lake Huron. And the Soviet Union embarked on a massive collective agricultural irrigation scheme, not to tap into the Aral Sea itself, which is a naturally brackish or somewhat salty system, but to tap into the large feeder rivers that fed the Aral Sea and then divert that fresh water out into the Central Asian desert so the desert could bloom. And the desert did bloom, but at great cost of the Aral Sea's ecosystem. This is a photo that I took here of the bottom of the Aral Sea uh, several years ago when I traveled there with a delegation of the Russian Academy of Sciences. 1960, at this area, the water was 45, 50 feet deep. You had ferry boats taking people from Kazakhstan to Uzbekistan. You had a teeming fishery with fishing trawlers passing overhead. Now, all directions of the compass, as far as the eye can see, no water. It's a very chilling place for a Great Lakes guy to visit. So these are satellite photos of the Aral Sea since the early 1960s up to today. As you can see, it's lost 96% of its volume and 90% of its surface area uh, since the early 1960s. So there's been a, a bit of a controversy. I have a chapter on the Aral Sea in my Great Lakes Water Diversion book, not because I'm alleging that this is what's going to happen here in the Great Lakes region, not at all. If you read the chapter, you, those who haven't read the chapter are jumping to that conclusion. But as a journalist writing about the Great Lakes water diversion controversy, scientists, government officials, uh, uh, environmental advocates in their interviews would always reference the Aral Sea. Yet none of them had ever been there. And so I thought if this Aral Sea situation is this touchstone for the Great Lakes citizens in the Great Lakes region, and so few had been there, that it would be a public service to citizens like all of you, to go there in one short chapter and write the story of what happened in the Aral Sea and leave it up to citizens in the Great Lakes region to decide what is relevant between the Aral Sea situation and what is not here in the Great Lakes region. We're talking about a desert ecosystem here. As we can see today, we don't have a desert ecosystem here in the Great Lakes region. But as a Great Lakes guy, I did bring back one personal take-home message from my visit to the Aral Sea, which is that Having seen what has happened there in just a few short decades, one cannot credibly stand on the shore of a North American Great Lake and argue that it is so vast that it's invincible. What the Aral Sea situation shows is that these large lakes, despite their magnitude, are actually quite vulnerable, quite fragile. And we need to keep that in mind when we talk about water management in the Great Lakes region. Okay. So, we, um, we looked at a global picture. Now we're zeroing in on the continental picture. This is a map of the lower western 48 states published by our own federal government, U.S. Department of Interior, predicting potential water supply crisis areas by the year 2025, not that far down the road. For those of you in the back, it's a classic color coding scheme where the areas in yellow is a moderate potential for water supply conflict, orange is substantial, and red is highly likely. Obviously, there's a lot of red and orange on this map. The only state on this map that doesn't have color coding on it is the state of South Dakota. Every other state in the lower western 48, according to our own federal government, has at least a moderate potential for water supply conflict in the lower western 48. And again, there's a lot of uh, substantial and highly likely. So there are a lot of hot spots, not just in the Southwest, and I'm just gonna click on these. We don't have time today to go into detail, but we can during the Q&A. All these red circles are water tension hot spots in the United States of varying degrees. The Colorado River watershed is quite a mess right now, and that's what my op-ed in the New York Times this week was about. Uh, and the Ipswich River outside of Boston is a very different situation. But if you look at those red circles, they represent an arc of water tension on the south side of the Great Lakes Basin. And it's this arc of water tension that tends to drive, in part, the Great Lakes water diversion debate, sometimes accurately and sometimes inaccurately. The other thing that drives the water diversion debate in the Great Lakes region is plans like this one from early 1960s called the Grand Canal Proposed Distribution System. And so this is an idea uh, proposed by Tom Kieran's 
who is a now deceased uh, engineer in Canada uh, to, you, you can see where J Hudson's Bay is there, the lower right hand corner is James Bay, and then that red line is a dam that the Grand Canal proposed distribution idea proposed to put across James Bay, and then allowing these large Arctic streams in northern Canada to eventually transform James Bay from a saltwater system to a freshwater system, then canal that freshwater down into northern Lake Huron, thereby making the flow out of Lake Superior into Lake Huron superfluous, and then we send that uh, basically the equivalent of the St. Mary's River flow out of Lake Superior west, out into the Canadian prairies, and then ultimately down into the American Southwest. Super controversial, uh, as you might imagine at the time, and enormously expensive. There was another similar American plan, similar but different, called NAWAPA, North American Water and Power Alliance, of the same generation. And these plans were literally talking about replumbing uh, the North American continent. Um, and they eventually fell under their own controversies, their own uh, financial burdens, et cetera. And the fear is, in a period of crisis, that these old plans would be dusted off and that we might have these controversies reemerge again. But it was controversies like this that started to grab the focus of governors and premiers in the Great Lakes region to start thinking about protecting the waters of the Great Lakes. Okay, so we had a global picture. We had a brief continental picture. Now we're zeroing in on my favorite part, which is the Great Lakes section of this talk. If you look here, this, great, this green shaded line surrounding the five lakes is the Great Lakes watershed, the Great Lakes basin. Think of it as a soup bowl rim that surrounds the five Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. And this water, rain, snow, groundwater recharge that occurs within that soup bowl rim is a secret to water sustainability and recharge in the Great Lakes watershed. Rain, snowfall, groundwater recharge outside of that flows into Hudson's Bay, Mississippi River, Atlantic Ocean, etc. Note, if you will, how far or how wide the area is between the uh, watershed line and the shoreline in some areas on this map, and how remarkably narrow that line is between the shoreline and the basin line in other areas. It's these areas where the shoreline is closer to the basin line, as we'll hear more about later, where water tensions in the Great Lakes region are highest. We'll talk about that more, but first, cool Great Lakes stats. Great Lakes hold one-fifth of all the fresh surface water on the planet, as John mentioned, which is just amazing. That's enough volume to cover the lower 48 states and nearly 10 feet of water. But the key statistic today is only 1% of the water in the Great Lakes region is renewed annually through rainfall, snowfall, and groundwater recharge. Just 1%. So think of the Great Lakes as this gift from the glaciers deposited in the heart of the North American continent 10,000 years ago, this water bank account. Then you have this 1% of water interest that flows through that bank account on an annual basis. And the key is that we don't want to consume annually more than that 1% and then start to dig into the lake's principal bank account. We're not even close, but we don't have great data yet binationally on exactly how much consuming water we are consuming. And I, I hope we can do a better job of that as we move into what I call the century of water that we're in now. So all Great Lakes, you, you all know this, also nourish 35 million people in the U.S. and Canada on a really unique cold water ecosystem. And this is not very well known. If you take the regional economy, the two Canadian provinces of Ontario, Quebec, and the eight Great Lakes states, the entire states and provinces, not just within the basin, but the economies of all those 10 jurisdictions, it comes up to the third largest economy in the world, 5.8 trillion gallons and 5.8 trillion dollars. And much, though not all, of that economy is water dependent. Okay, this is that same map of the Great Lakes Basin with a bunch of arrows on it. These arrows represent all the human poking and prodding that has occurred within and outside the Great Lakes Basin over the last 200 years or so. So these, each of these arrows represents a wa an existing water diversion. Some of them are givers, some of them are takers. There actually are big diversions on North Shore of Lake Superior, where I live, that are dumping water in for hydro uh, reasons. Uh, but there, you know, so all these represent, you know, their size is how big they are, and the point of the arrow is the direction these diversions go. The point is that we have really manipulated the system a lot over the last century. The biggest and most controversial diversion of all is in Chicago, the Great Lakes 
uh, uh, biggest diversion taking water out of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, why is this here? Go back to the late 1800s, you have the Great Chicago Fire torches much of the downtown area. The city embarks on this massive effort to rebuild itself. It becomes this booming metropolis out on the prairie. And it's becoming, getting really close really fast to about a million people. And it's growing so fast that its water infrastructure can't keep up with the population growth. So you have sewage running through the streets in some areas. You had uh, un unregulated outhouses all over the place. But really what was remarkable, we would hard to imagine today, were these massive, massive stockyards on the south side of town. Thousands of animals waiting to be slaughtered. So you have all the waste from those animals while they're waiting to be slaughtered. Anecdotal evidence of the, the, the Chicago River running red with blood because of all the filth that was flowing out of the slaughterhouses in the Chicago River. There's a famous tributary called Bubbly Creek that would crust over and chickens and cats would run across this crust on top of the Chicago River. And so what would happen is you get big summer storm events would flush out the Chicago River down into Lake Michigan and then you have boat captains and fishermen who would come in with alarm saying there's this grotesque sewage slick out far into Lake Michigan that's getting really close to the city's water intake structures which are still visible today two miles offshore. So the city was very paranoid that its unsustainable water management practices were on the brink of polluting its drinking water supply. And so what it did is it built this 28 mile canal to reverse the flow of the Chicago River, dump it into this 28 mile canal which then connects to the Des Plaines River which connects to the Illinois River which connects to the Mississippi River. So Chicago's plan was to flush its toilet to St. Louis. <laughs> Not popular in Missouri. Missouri challenged in the Supreme Court. Long, complicated case. The justices couldn't tell whose sewage came from whose, and so they let Chicago off the hook. That's a gross oversimplification of a very complicated case. <laughs> but the point is, pun intended, uh, the point is that, uh, that Illinois won, and the canal opened, and today, 2.1 billion gallons of Great Lakes water flows through metropolitan Chicago to the Gulf of Mexico every day. According to the International Joint Commission, and this is an audience that's very familiar with the IJC, that one diversion lowered water levels on Lakes Michigan and Huron by 2.5 inches. Lake Superior, again, where I live, largest lake by surface area in the world, but if you combine Huron and Michigan, hydrologically they are one lake. They are larger than Lake Superior, so this one diversion lowered literally the largest lake in the world by 2.5 inches. Inches matter in low water periods, as you know. In the early part of this uh, century, we went through a long period of low water periods, and uh, they matter environmentally and commercially. And so this is now seen as sort of the poster child of what we don't want to have happen, because if you replicate this a half a dozen times, we're not talking about inches, we're talking about feet, and feet really matter in the Great Lakes. Again, as you know, on the other hand, this is the water diversion trade-off, right? Chicago would not be the global city it is today if it were not for this water diversion. Okay, so that's a controversial water diversion uh, uh, on the American side at the beginning of the last century. Now we have a controversial water diversion proposal on the Canadian side at the end of the last century. This is the Nova Group proposal, a small consulting firm in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, proposed a plan to tanker 158 million gallons of pristine Lake Superior water to Asia every year. The idea was to create a global market for Great Lakes exported water. Think of it as Fiji water in reverse, basically. It was around the same time, actually, that uh, Fiji was proposed. And so it, was, it, it could not have been stopped. This was the big alarm. It was not stoppable by laws in Canada. And it had been approved. It had been permitted by the, the province of Ontario. It could have been stopped by laws in the United States, but U.S. laws don't work in Canada. So there was no way to stop this, and again, it was permitted. It wasn't until after it was permitted that the public heard about it, and the public came out in droves. And the reason the public came out in droves in opposition to this was not that 158 million gallons is a lot for Lake Superior, because it's not. It was the legal precedent. And the lawyer said, with this Great Lakes water diversion debate, in modern times, Chicago is an anachronism legally, they argue, and in modern times, if we set a precedent to take Great Lakes water outside the Great Lakes watershed once, then we have set a precedent for the, let's say we do it for 50 miles out, then, you, then, then somebody who wants to come 100 miles out, or, or 500 miles out, or whatever. 
And the lawyers went to the governors and premiers in the Great Lakes region and said, you're sending Great Lakes water to Asia. That's your nightmare legal precedent. You're not going to be able to stop a run on the Great Lakes unless you fix this. So the NOVA proposal led to the Great Lakes Compact. Over the next seven years or longer, uh, let's see, 1998 to 2008, so yeah, 10 years. The governors and premiers got together and produced the Great Lakes Compact, which was signed by President Bush on October 3rd, 2008. As I said, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the compact uh, right now. Um, and Ontario and Quebec adopted similar legislation on the Canadian side of the border. So the compact is just on the U.S. side, and then there's other legislation on the Canadian side enveloping all five Great Lakes and the same anti-water diversion rules and regulations. It's this seen as this remarkable bipartisan agreement adopted in the absence of a crisis. When's the last time you heard that? And it's also a global model for inter international transboundary water management. So key points in the compact, we're going to get in the weeds just a little bit on a few slides here because the weeds matter on water. Uh, so it's a ban on diversions with limited exceptions. Those limited exceptions are for straddling communities and straddling counties. So if you look at that uh, orangish red square there, there's that dotted line coming down. That's the Great Lakes Basin line. That's how close it is to the watershed. Remember in southeast Wisconsin, northeastern Illinois, uh, that you can, it's a little bit faded out with the light in here, but if you have a, a, so that's a straddling county. That's Waukesha County, southeastern Wisconsin. We're going to talk about more later. You can see it straddles the basin line, and then we also have a community there that also straddles the Great Lakes Basin line. The authors of the compact knew that they had these places that straddle the line, especially the communities. And they had a community, New Berlin, Wisconsin, suburb of Milwaukee, was completely bifurcated by the Great Lakes Basin line. The part of town that's inside the basin was drinking beautiful Lake Michigan water. The part outside the basin was actually on a naturally contaminated aquifer, contaminated with radium, a radioactive element. And so the people on one side of the street were dr drinking treated, but contaminated, originally contaminated water. You walk across the street in the same town, same plumbing, same urban plumbing, and you have people drinking Great Lakes water. The authors of the compact wanted to fix that. And they wanted to allow the people who were outside the basin in these straddling community towns to apply for a limited diversion just for that other side of town to also drink Great Lakes water and then treat it to Clean Water Act standards and return that water to the Great Lakes. Okay? Straddling community water diversion applications only require the approval of the local governor. Straddling county applications are much more complicated and much more controversial. Straddling county applicants, if you're a city, which is a real example we're going to talk about, like Waukesha, in Waukesha County, but the city is clean and clear outside the watershed, but happens to reside in a county that straddles the watershed, these communities, if they have a public water supply problem, can also apply for a Great Lakes water diversion, but because they're clean and clear outside the basin, these straddling county applicants need the approval of all eight Great Lakes governors, from Minnesota to New York much higher bar. If you're not in a straddling community, if you're not in a straddling county, you can't even ask for a Great Lakes water diversion, and that's the big change that the compact brought. Okay, again, just to review these requirements, in order to be even considered for a Great Lakes water diversion in a straddling community or straddling county, you must agree to return the water after it's used, so there's no net loss to the Great Lakes volume. Water conservation uh, has to be a huge part of your water diversion application. You have to prove that you have no reasonable water supply alternatives. The Great Lakes basically have to be an option of last resort. And you have to prove that your diversion will not create adverse environmental impacts. Okay, so the first major test case was in Waukesha. Uh, in 2010, they applied for a water diversion. Uh, again, straddling county application required the approval of all eight Great Lakes governors. They're on this depleted, contaminated groundwater. Again, radium, a radioactive element. This is naturally occurring uh, and, and uh, a big issue. They're under state and federal pressure to find an alternate water source. Super controversial. 11,000 comments came in. Almost all were opposed. Again, they needed the approval of all eight Great Lakes governors. Their application was for 10 million gallons 
uh, per day. And uh, the technical review at the DNR took five years, which was an eternity, especially when you were waiting to publish your second edition of your book, and this had to happen first. <laughs> um, and then uh, once the DNR uh, uh, reviewed it and said it was worthy of consideration by the eight Great Lakes governors, then the eight Great Lakes governors, along with the provincial premiers, reviewed Waukesha's application. The premiers have a vote. Uh, sorry, a voice, but not a vote over water diversions in the United States, and the governors have a voice, but not a vote over water diversions in Canada. And so after that review, uh, Waukesha was approved unanimously by the governors. It was a squeaker. Minnesota hung on till the end, keeping everyone in suspense, but they had to cut, Waukesha had to cut their service area. The originally requested service area was there in gold and then they ended up with what's in blue, which is essentially their existing service area. Um, that, so that cut by, by more than 50%, and then the diversion was cut uh, from 10 million to 8.2 million gallons per day. Again, 100% of the water returned, uh, and this does not set precedent for long-range, large-scale diversions. That's, those are no longer allowed under the Great Lakes Compact. It only sets precedent for other potential future applicants from straddling counties, period. That's it. Okay, the Great Lakes mayors appealed to Waukesha's decision. It looked for a minute like the mayors in the Great Lakes region and the governors were going to end up in court suing each other over the Waukesha decision. In the end, they agreed on an out-of-court settlement, and arguments about that are still kind of continuing and percolating here in the Great Lakes region. Then there was this big surprise when we have Foxconn, this major uh, 27th largest company in the world uh, decides that it's going to build a facility in southeastern Wisconsin, that hot spot I was talking about earlier, the size of three pentagons, to uh, make flat screens for TVs and phones. Uh, they, they came to Wisconsin with uh, more than three billion, some say four, in tax incentives and other incentives uh, uh, provided by the state of Wisconsin and under Governor Walker. The problem for Foxconn is they picked a site where the, the three Pentagon facility itself straddles the Great Lakes Basin Line. So they have to apply for a water diversion to send water to the other side of the plant. I'll have an image on that. So here's the Foxconn facility, all those big buildings in white. That's more than a mile wide, that whole facility there. Uh, on the bottom, and here's an image of where the Great Lakes Basin Line cuts right through the factory's footprint. Um, and so they have to apply for a water diversion. Well, only communities can apply for a water diversion. Factories can't. So the community of Mount Pleasant needs to apply on behalf of Foxconn. Well, Mount Pleasant doesn't have its own water supply system. It's kind of a suburb of Racine. So, it has, so Foxconn has to ask Mount Pleasant to apply, which has to ask Racine to apply on behalf of Foxconn. So Racine, Wisconsin, applies for a water diversion last year on behalf of Foxconn, asking for 7 million gallons per day. The DNR approved the, the, the Foxconn uh, com straddling community water diversion application in April of 2008. Immediately, the Midwest Environmental Advocates filed a lawsuit along with the League of Women Voters and others, and that lawsuit is pending. Uh, so this is a map. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of that image, you can see Milwaukee on the top, Chicago on the bottom, and then that detail rectangle is what we're seeing here on the left, you have the community of Racine, the community of Mount Pleasant, and then Sturdivant is a small town in between. But that blue area in the down in the lower left-hand corner shows the Foxconn corporate campus and how the Great Lakes Basin line, again, cuts right through uh, that campus area. So Foxconn's key problem, key issue, is that the Great Lakes Compact says that water diversions can only be for public water supply purposes. And the language specifically says, serving a group of largely residential customers that may also serve industrial, commercial, and other institutional operators. So the question is, is the Racine Foxconn water diversion serving largely residential customers? Doesn't seem like it at face value, but in fact, the authors of the compact that I interviewed for my updated edition of the book disagreed with each other about that language. It's like the founding fathers disagreeing about the language in the, in the Constitution, just completely fascinating. On one side, you have compact authors who say residential public water supply refers to the, 
the, the community that's delivering the water, in that case Racine, and is the vast majority of its customer base residential or commercial? Well, the answer is residential, so then it would be fine. On the other hand, there are compact authors who said absolutely not. It refers to the community receiving the water, which would be Mount Pleasant, with 13,000 new employees in this big factory. In fact, you could really debate that it's not uh, residential at all. So this is a crucial legal difference that will be teased out by this litigation. Meanwhile, Foxconn announced this week, kind of in an interview with Reuters, that it might be reducing what it's doing in, in, in uh, southeastern Wisconsin. But then President Trump had a conversation with Terry Goh, the CEO of Foxconn, and maybe they're back on again. So um, it's crazy. Uh, it's definitely crazy. Meanwhile, the litigation uh, continues. OK, right in that same neighborhood, so Waukesha, you know, uh, 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 Foxconn, now we have Pleasant Prairie, all in that same neighborhood. I'll show you a map in a minute. Uh, the big exclusive thing that came out in the book is I already had a chapter on Pleasant Prairie in my first edition. They received a water diversion under the pre-compact system, which I'm not going to get into now, but we can talk about it in Q&A if you want. And they received a small diversion of 3.2 million gallons per day back in 1989. And after the compact was adopted, all the states had to report to the Great Council of Great Lakes Governors all their existing diversions so that they could be grandfathered in. So that if we, you know, every state has some diversions, little, big, you know, those arrows that we talked about earlier in the, that prior map, they needed to get those on record. Where are they and how big are they? And so when Wisconsin was reporting the Pleasant Prairie diversion, it decided to increase the amount of that diversion from 3.2 million gallons per day to 10.69 million gallons per day, which is a boost of 7.5 million gallons per day. But they didn't notify the public. That's, that amount is larger than the entire diversion that Foxconn is requesting. It's almost as much as Waukesha received. And Pleasant Prairie is a community of 21,000, and Waukesha is a community of 70,000. In fact, that's enough surplus water for Pleasant Prairie to host the Foxconn facility and not even have to apply for a Great Lakes water diversion application. Foxconn would have life much easier if it had decided to end up uh, in Pleasant Prairie. So. Uh, why was the diversion in Wisconsin tripled? Wisconsin has this unique law that argues that the water delivery piping needs to match up with your sewer piping. And there's a big sewer system in Pleasant Prairie, so they just added that 7.5 million gallons per day on top to match the two series of plumbings. And again, they didn't notify anybody. And it wasn't until the book came out that this controversy over Pleasant Prairie getting this unknown big water diversion happened. And the reaction in Pleasant Prairie was interesting. It says, we've come under scrutiny because of this book. And as part of the book, they're trying to promote their sales, so they have to make some things that are not that dramatic, somewhat dramatic. I think it's much to do about nothing. <laughs> well, much to do about nothing was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, the front page of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and ran on the Associated Press from coast to coast. So I don't think it's quite uh, much to do about nothing. And, uh, uh, and environmentalists are consulting attorneys and the Michigan governor's office is investigating as well. So just to put it in perspective, if you look on the left here, the Pleasant Prairie original diversion is that you know, 3.2 uh, million gallons per day, then the Waukesha diversion, and then the Racine diversion. And so the Pleasant Prairie diversion, no one knew until the book came out, but Pleasant Prairie was the largest water diversion in the state of Wisconsin on paper and no one knew until the book came out. Journalists are into transparency, usually citizens are too, so uh, it's good that we all know what the largest diversion is in Wisconsin now. Whoop. Um, can you bring that back up? Just two slides left. Um, and so really, uh, this whole point about southeastern Wisconsin and northeastern Illinois um, being the front line in the Great Lakes Water War. So we, the Chicago diversion is there, the Waukesha diversion is there, the Foxconn diversion is there, and the um, Pleasant Prairie diversion is there. And so, one more, there we go, yeah. So this is that whole, so this is that, again, northeastern Illinois, southeastern Wisconsin, all these dots in here are water diversion hotspots. The state of Wisconsin now has more water diversions than all the other Great Lakes states combined. And then the largest and most controversial diversion is in the Illinois, uh, the Chicago metropolitan area. And so again, this is where the action is. Uh, and it seems a long way from where you are here, but you're at the tail end of the system. 
So you need to be conscious of, aware of all that happens upstream because it all comes by here or doesn't come by here. So it's important to stay engaged. Water policy is complicated, um, but we need to dive into the complexities, embrace them, and know about them, just like Plan 2014, not exactly a simple issue, um, which I talk about in my book as well. So just to wrap up, overall the compact is working as expected. It's got this ban on diversions, the, you know, the big, large-scale, long-range diversions just are not going to happen anymore. Unsustainable practices elsewhere, which is again what I wrote about in the New York Times this week, uh, are going to have people continue to look to the Great Lakes with envy, and it's important that we remain vigilant uh, in protecting the Great Lakes and keeping on top of things, not just in our region, but in other regions, especially the water-stressed ones. As I said, southeast Wisconsin has become the new front line with Illinois uh, right in there as well. More return flow water diversion applications are expected. That's part of the process. That's what the compact allows. It's up to the citizens to have their voices heard to decide whether they're legit or not. The question now is who will be next? We don't know, but there will be somebody, I'm sure. Stay tuned. Super attentive audience. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Yes, sir. Yes. We'll we'll wait for a microphone to oh, sorry, I didn't know that. Yep. Okay. Given the size and scope of the Foxconn proposal, um, it baffles me why they chose a site that had such an encumbrance on being this water diversion requirement. Baffles me too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll just go back to that slide, right? I mean, and there, you know, there's quite a conversation about this. Um, if they move that facility 2,000 feet to the east, no lawsuit. Um, now, that's a highly develop, developed part of the state, so getting the real estate was tricky. There was one large landowner that didn't want Foxconn to come in, so, but they, in my opinion, they spent more time focusing on how cl close they were to on-ramps and on-ramps, off-ramps on the freeway than they were to the, the, the I, I called up the DNR and I said, right when it first announced, I said, seriously? And they said, we told them. So, here we are in court. Way in the back, back there. Hi there, Michael Twist. Um, we enjoyed your talk. Can you explain to us why the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909 between Canada and the United States can't do the work that the compact seems to do with respect to the breeze? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's a lot of confusion about that. So the, basically, the Boundary Waters Treaty only refers to, I'm oversimplifying those lawyers in the room, really big stuff, like the Chicago River, that you can measure you know, big changes. It was a blunt instrument in dealing with water diversions, and it didn't deal with the smaller stuff that could be precedential, that could lead to a yellow brick road to Las Vegas or wherever over time. And so they needed this more refined document that helped deal with these smaller diversions that could be a legal challenge later on. Yeah, really important question. So another question over there while we're close to the mic, and then we'll come over here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'd be curious, how does the Great Lakes Charter relate to uh, uh, the, the Great Lakes Compact? Could you explain that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the Great Lakes Charter was the first attempt at dealing with this boundary water question that we were t talking about earlier, that the boundary waters was this really big, uh, boundary waters treaty was this really big idea. Uh, the charter came in the 1980s when I, I kind of walked through this in my book, but there was a whole series of things that happened in the 70s and 80s that just looked like this mission creep towards the Great Lakes. There's all sorts of different proposals, Corps of Engineers, Coal Slurry Pipeline, etc. So the Great Lakes charter was rushed in and it also had limitations on these kinds of things that we're talking about here, but because it was rushed, it was non-binding. And so what we had was governors and provincial premiers signed on to it, but then as soon as something happened in their respective jurisdiction, they would violate it. 
And so we had rules that they made for themselves and then they didn't follow their own rules. So that was sort of like limping along and then we had something called the Water Resource Development Act of 1986. Well that just took care, that fixed things on the US side of the border, kind of. But then NOVA happened and we're like, we need something that crosses both sides of the international boundary and takes care of all diversions, not just the big ones, and it needs to be binding, it has to have teeth, and the charter didn't have binding teeth. Thank you very much. Yeah. So there was a question over here, yeah. I have uh, two questions, one uh, specifically about Foxconn, which has been mentioned, the other about NAFTA. Uh, I understand that the Foxconn decision to reduce their footprint is apparently still a bit up in the air. Right. But could you comment on the extent to which you think the water war may have pushed them to change their decision? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, uh, how much the legal challenge is affecting their decision. It's the, the wording is really weird. They're not being, uh, you know, they're just sort of had an interview with Reuters. It wasn't like there was a press conference. It's very hard for journalists to kind of access um, Foxconn. We get statements, but there's not a lot of interviewing going on. They did an interview with the New York Times after the Reuters, Reuters thing. So it's not clear. It's just, it's a great question, but it's, there's just not a lot of transparency on what exactly the, 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 uh, the uh, Foxconn official quote in Reuters story blamed it more on global markets than on water, but we don't really know what all is influencing the decision. So it's, uh, it's like a new Foxconn thing every day lately. So stay tuned on that one too. Okay. The other question I have is about uh, NAFTA. The previous uh, NAFTA agreement was careful to point out that this agreement created no particular or new water rights for any of the member states to it. Can you comment on whether or not the new NAFTA, or is, I know it's not yet ratified by the legislature, but can you comment on the to which the new NAFTA, NAFTA retains that restriction? Yeah, so again, my understanding is that, so the old NAFTA was like basically hands off our water. You got each country, Mexico, United States, Canada, just sort of has its own rights over this water. And that's supposedly folded into the new NAFTA as well. So should be, should be fine. The, the prior rules were fine. How that, I talk about this in my book, how that intersects with the World Trade Organization organiz, uh, rules on water is a different thing. Uh, and so that's kind of where the, the big deal is. So maybe one more question, we'll close out. Or so, yeah, right over here. Yeah, boy, we'd get the hardest question right at the end. I should have cut it off before. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, so uh, bottled water is uh, uh, the two things that almost crashed the compact negotiations were uh, the, sh the, the Chicago River and bottled water. And each state has its own water personality, and each state has its own kind of water personality and bottled water. Um, and so uh, I'm going to try and do this hard one quickly. Um, so there was a debate about is shipping a bottle of water outside the basin a diversion? Well, if it's shipping a bottle of water out is a diversion, what about a bottle of beer that's mainly water? Or what about a gallon of milk that's mainly water? Or what about cheese that's made from milk that's made from Great Lakes water? And so that's, this is actually a real thing, it's called virtual water that you can divert your water outside of your watershed in a product. Uh, and they went round and round and round on this. And then Ontario, again, oversimplifying, sort of raised his hand and said, hey, we went through this uh, after the NOVA proposal, and we just decided to not worry about the small stuff. And we cut, we cut it off at 20 liters, which is roughly 5.7 gallons. Um, and, 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 that, and, you know, we would love it if we just, you know, we all agreed we're not going to worry about the small bottles, we're just going to worry about the big bottles. And that was like the compromise in the room that everybody went for. Uh, it makes sense on the Canadian side because it's 20 liters. On the U.S. side, there's like, why would we say 5.7 gallons? Why wouldn't we say 6 or 5 or 5.5, but why 5.7? Um, and then the, the idea was that each jurisdiction, if it wanted to ban water diversions in bottles from its jurisdiction, it could do so. Um, and nobody has, but that's a 
really quick explanation. So bottles smaller than 5.7 gallons are not considered diversions, and bottles larger than 5.7 are. Happy to talk to anybody during breaks. Thanks for a great question this morning. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I just have two comments. The, uh, the Foxconn diversion, when those lawsuits, when that lawsuit went in, Save the River uh, supported it, backed it. I think, and Save the River think, that diversions is a generational issue and that everybody in the room needs to start to get up to speed on this. And that's not just a plug for uh, his wonderful book. Th this issue is coming. We, our water resources out there, people in this country, people around the world are going to try to take it away. Interestingly enough, that suit was filed, their diversion was 7 million gallons a day they were looking for. I think the day after the suit was filed, it dropped down to 3.5 million. And I think they wanted everybody to say, isn't that great, we've won. Well, until it gets down to nothing, I believe that suit is going to stay in there. Then I think they have the right to go in and try to run it up through the compact channels, but it's going to be a battle. 